No. Good morning. You're here at Flow HQ, and we're going to have something different for you today. We're not going to do a usual Q and A on a Wednesday morning here. It's because we have a special guest. So those of you who have been following might uh, know that we have the beekeeper.org, which is a program aimed to educate beekeepers, and it's also aimed to raise funds. Basically, experts from all around the world are, are chiming in to put some great contact together, uh, great content together, and from that, we also raise funds which allow us to do some great things for the pollinators in the world things we do is called bee friendly farming now it's not our program what we've been able to do is donate funds both it to in the in the usa and in australia and bring that uh program here to australia so it's um it's a wonderful program that that works with farmers now we're in what is really a crisis where we're 40 percent of insects on our planet are facing uh are threatened and and facing extinction so that has huge ramifications especially um you know directly to our global food system with all our pollinators and also in general the very matrix of life that that supports um, us and all of the other um, uh, life on the planet. So what we need to do, farming taking up a lot of the land space um, does have a huge effect. It's the biggest effect is habitat loss for our pollinators and other effects like the agrochemical usage and um, it, it, that's also a, a really big effect. So what we need to do is provide pollinators with safe homes again. And that is what bee-friendly farming is all about. So joining us today, we've got Fiona Chambers from the Wean Bee Foundation in Australia. She's the one uh, bringing bee-friendly farming to Australia. And we've kicked off here now with a couple of farms already. And she's going to tell us more about what's happening in the USA and what we're doing in Australia. Welcome, Fiona Chambers. Thanks, Ada. Great, great to be with you. Um, yeah, look, we're so excited about the Bee Friendly Farming Program. Um, it's been something that's been a couple of years in the pipeline. Um, I guess a little bit of context for how it how it began. Um, we, as a foundation, Win Bee Foundation, uh, uh, Australian charity for bees, and we were looking for ways that we could really have great impact um, and help as many bees as possible. And of course, Australia has not only the, the honeybee, but over two and a half thousand different species of bee. And so when we looked at um, the risk factors, habitat loss being a major one, when we looked at um, agriculture taking up uh, about 60% of Australia's land mass, we thought, well, where we can have the maximum impact is by improving habitat on farms, which is the majority of Australia's um, landmass. So we started looking around for programs. We, you know, we wanted to partner. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. And um, we found the Bee Friendly Farming Program in America to be running for about 12 years. Um, it was already quite well established. It was science-based, um, evidence-based, and... Um, had been designed by a number of really uh, eminent researchers. So it, it had the, the scores on the board. Um, and in the States at the moment, um, last year's figures, they've got about 800 different um, farm sites across the States representing about 65,000 acres at this point. Um, and that growth, they, they're undergoing pretty major growth at the moment because they've got a number of um, businesses coming on board that are saying this is such a good thing and our commitment to sustainability we're actually going to pay our farmers to convert to be be friendly farming accredited so um so it's yeah. it was um we we decided to partner with the pollinator partnership the be friendly farming program is a program run by uh, like a sister charity in the states called the pollinator partnership and um, so, yeah, so that picture shows all the different sites that spread the 800 farms right across America. 
Um, the pollinator partnership is we just felt had really really similar values to WNB Foundation that we we wanted it to be any program to be based on science and have those rigors and this program is so we are just incredibly excited to now after the couple of years of of negotiating and working with pollinator partnership to actually have it launched in Australia. Fantastic! That's a, an amazing amount of effort and when you consider the impact of. 800 farms doing things differently, planting flowers. Could you tell us a bit more about what they actually do in terms of um, habitat? Yeah, so so one of the, look, there's a number of requirements that farms need to do. And one of them is they need to plant a, a minimum of 3% of their land and commit that to, to floral resources. So the, the goal is to have floral resources growing throughout the growing season. So if you think about which pollinators that's impacting, um, when, when we think about honeybees pollinating farm crops, that pollination window is often only three weeks, four weeks. You know, it's a very short window. So we have a system where honeybees migrate to deliver paid pollination services. But we, we have hundreds and thousands of other pollinators and insects in the ecosystem. And if we don't look to plant to have flowers across the calendar year beyond that, that three or four week crop window, then we're not supporting the diversity of pollinators in the environment that of course those farms need and rely on as well. So the program is really about increasing, um, planting that 3% strategically so you've got flowering across the calendar year to support not just honeybees when they might be doing a paid pollination service. ...range of other pollinators um, and insects that are performing other ecosystem services. Um, so that, so the, the flowering is one, one part of it, the 3%. Um, it's also about providing water resources to make sure that there's sufficient water for pollinators in the environment. It's also about providing habitat um, because flowers provide food, but they don't necessarily provide habitat. So it's providing habitat so there's a place for insects to reproduce um, and um, throughout the year. Um, and then the final thing is around the chemical usage. And whilst this program is not a, it's not a, it's not a, an organic program. It's not saying you must not use chemicals, but what it does require is that. Um, people really look about their ways that they can minimise their chemical use. And so integrated pest management is a, an absolute absolute keystone component of this program. So we, we require people to think about um, uh, building that diversity of insects so they get um, a range of, of services. So you've got a more balanced ecosystem. In that situation, people don't need to use as much um, as many chemicals, and we think that's a really positive step in the right direction. So obviously, it would be best if there wasn't any chemical use at all, right? And that's the, that's yep. the end game. But I guess we've got a situation where we've, we've got millions of farms around the globe doing something in one way, and if you suddenly jump and say no more chemical use whatsoever, all done. I guess the ramifications of that would be one hard to hard to get any um, uh, I guess buy in on that in terms of rapid change, but also um, it, uh, there could be ramifications in um, farmers actually being able to produce. Um, so so what you're suggesting here is more of a changeover where we're we're creating the habitat, we're limiting the use of agrochemicals, and with with the intention of of phasing them out. Correct. Yeah, so I look at it, I think of it a bit like cars. You know, if, if we've got heaps of cars in the environment, we know that cars cause pollution and they're problematic, but we're not ready to give up cars. So it's a bit like saying we're working on providing the alternative fuels so it's, it's less impact on the environment rather than just saying we're banning cars. So, you know, I see in the farming system, it's a, a similar sort of thing. We're not saying we're banning the chemicals. We're just saying we need you to work on the alternatives using integrated pest management, which is going to reduce your reliance on chemicals and in some cases eliminate them. 
Um, so, you know, that's that's the end game that we, you'd like to think. And it's in farmers' interest too because if they don't have to pay for the chemicals, they're better off as well. But we're not asking them to forego their crop and their livelihood um, as, as they work towards that end game. I'd love to find a solution where there was no insecticides being sprayed on flowers, which is, you know, extremely detrimental to our to our insects, um, both pollinators and others, that are doing their incredible work. And and I've actively looked into technology to try and work on that. Um, I haven't managed to land it yet, but I'm hoping one day we can provide a solution not the damaging effects, uh, effects of insecticides. And oh, look, here's a teddy bear bee, which is is a beautiful Australian native bee, which um, looks like a, a big teddy bear. And it's some of my sister's work of um, chasing bees around the garden with her phone, getting these beautiful shots. And that's right here behind us. So we're dropping the, that footage in into the live stream. And look, at it, they've got a really long proboscis going right down inside the flower. Um, isn't that isn't that beautiful? So it's not only the the European honeybee, right? It's all, um, in Australia we have um, uh, a couple of thousand um, native yeah. bee species that that all need um, that all need habitat, that all need forage, that all need safe places to to be able to forage, and also uh, a place to to nest. Uh, uh, things like the blue banded bee. They actually need mud to nest in, so they need some an area that's um, got a, a a mud wall, like a, a bank, to to drill holes into, and um, create their young there. So, um, but other species are using reeds and um, or just uh, basically areas that are unkept. Right, we need to leave spaces be so that they can become wild, so that they can support the habitat that that. Um, then it supports all of our little species that make the world go round. And, and so in the Bee Friendly Farming Project, you're, um, there's a percentage of, of land that's put towards um, uh, habitat, right? Um, not only flowers, but habitat to, to stay wild. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's about 3%, 3 percent three percent on flowers on floral resources throughout the year. And there is no minimum on, I mean, often that's the habitat as well. So habitat could be, you know, 1%, 3%, um, and that depends a little bit on on farm, from farm to farm. But yeah, so it's, it is, it's really important. So we'll be opening up for questions. This is our usual time. We do do Q&A for all things bees. If you've got any questions specific for Fiona, or for myself, then please uh, chime in with the comments below. And we'll read out a couple of questions. And um, meanwhile, if you uh, if you know anybody with a farm that might like to sign up to the Bee Friendly Farming Project here in Australia, um, also in America, but here in Australia, we're kicking it off. We've helped fund the program to come to Australia with funds from our beekeeper.org program, which is an online course um, that's designed to take you from square one right through to a, a very in-depth knowledge in beekeeping and also raise funds to do important things like this, supporting programs like um, Fiona's running of, of helping create safer places on farms around the country and around the world. So thank you very much, Fiona, for... Um, for doing your great work. We've also we worked with Fiona in the past um, to help out the green carpenter bee on Kangaroo Island where, where uh, Adelaide University was helping create a substrate which, which gave some habitat to the endangered green carpenter bee on Kangaroo Island. More efforts since the fires there have been going in to rebuild homes for the green carpenter bee really really important work thank you so much for standing up and doing something for the bees that uh really do make our world go round. can i can i add a little bit there um just on bee friendly farming and i'm happy to talk a little bit about green carpenter bee too if you'd like but on on the bee friendly farming um there, there's three different categories that people can engage with the program so whilst we do have bee friendly farming and bee friendly farming is the the signature 
um, membership category with the largest capacity for impact. There's also bee friendly gardening, which is also a category of membership. So people don't necessarily have to have farms. They can have gardens um, and be involved. And then we've also got the partnership, which of course Flow has been um, fantastic as our, as our, um, as our platinum partners, our founding platinum partners, which has been incredibly, you know, we've appreciated. Um, but as in the partner category, if people are beekeepers, there's actually an apiarist category of membership as well. So if you keep bees, which I'm imagining most of the people listening in now are, then you can actually become an apiarist member of the program as well. So you may not own land or have land that you manage, but you can still support the program and support us to, to encourage more land to be kept in a bee-friendly farming way. Great. That's good to know about those options there. We'll put some links in the comments below so that we can um, encourage people to, to sign up and kick off with this program here in Australia and have the same kind of effect that's been happening in the USA with over 800 farms over there already creating um, habitat, already creating forage, already... Uh, doing things in different ways to be more pollinator supportive in in a in a world where where so much habitat loss is due to our impact of farming and feeding humans we certainly do need to work out different ways to do things and how we can hang on to some of the species that are right at the, the brink of extinction we're going to open up for questions now if you've got any questions or well, there's the green carpenter bee if anyone was wondering thanks Jai for for dropping that into the live feed isn't that an amazing amazing bee there's so many beautiful extraordinary pollinators out there and uh, it's really important that we hang on to them and look after the world around us by doing everything we can you can do it in your backyard you can get out and create some habitat you can leave you can uh, put away the insecticides get out the habitat leave areas of your yard to go wild it creates some um, habitats less work for you it's a win-win <laughs> I think the other thing um, say that we haven't mentioned is that the many of the native bee species in Australia have really, really closely co-evolved relationships with, with unique plant species. So what I mean by that is that only that bee will, will pollinate the plant. So if you lose the bee, you lose the plant. You lose the plant, you lose the bee potentially. So these, these highly co-evolved relationships are so critical because without them, you undermine biodiversity. So the other way of saying that is we need bees for biodiversity. We need that diverse insect base in our landscapes to maintain biodiversity. And without that biodiversity, we don't have the ecosystem health. So we, it's, they're so critical in the environment. So we've got a question here from Lisa Moller that says, is there legislation in place or coming soon to bring these bee-friendly farming practices into a mandated reality? So basically, obviously, if we, uh, if we do have legislation and political will, we can, we can really uh, get some rapid change happening. What do you know about that space, Fiona? Look, I, I'm not aware of any legislation per se. What I would say, though, is there is certainly moves uh, globally and also within Australia to there's a shift, a major shift that's happening that is all about taking an ecosystem approach to land management. And I see that as an incredibly positive move. So we've just had the United Nations declare um, this the decade of ecosystem services um, or uh, ecosystem restoration. So that is just fantastic. And Australia is following a very similar line um, with with looking at ecosystems. And so if you don't take an ecosystem approach, you're not looking at all of those little interactions and, and how important they are. So I'm very positive about the future because of that, even though there might not be legislation. <laughs> oh, oh, he's so handsome. I thought he was talking about you then, Cedar. It's the green carpenter bee. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Thanks, Margie. <laughs> Okay, so have we got any questions coming in? Yeah, look, um, Tiz is asking, and I think you've mentioned it, but maybe shout it out again, just how do we find out about this bee-friendly farming? Okay, we'll put links right in the comments yeah, below. You so can also find... Bee-friendlyfarming.org.au. 
Um, right. So there's yeah. So if you if you make sure you go to the Australian site. Well, it depends. For people in America, if you're tuning in from America, Be Friendly Farming, you'll go to the um, Pollinator Partnership site. I saw that there's quite a few people from the states and different countries. Um, so the Pollinator Partnership runs the Be Friendly Farming America site, um, and there's also a Canadian branch. Um, but BeFriendlyFarming.org.au is the Australian site. We've got our own dedicated site. Fantastic. And we have a link there for you to, to go through to that site as well. The, the other thing I'd say, if people are thinking, well, great, I'd love to be involved, but what do I plant? We actually, Wendy Foundation has been producing um, powerful pollinator planting guides, which are eco-regional or <clears throat> bio-regional planting guides. So those guides are available for free from the Wheaton Bee Foundation website. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. Um, so we, we've uh, been working and partnering with various universities to develop these guides. So they, the, there's a lot of information in them and they're designed to help you think about what to plant so that you've got flowering all across the calendar year or, or the season year at, at least. Um, obviously, if you've got snow on the ground for two months of the year, you're not going to have flowers. So, um, uh, but yeah, so those guides are available for free from the um, Wean Bee Foundation website too. Fantastic thing to do. We often get get asked what kind of flowers should we plant. If you if you look behind us here, we've got all sorts of flowers in in the garden, and we're often um, even witnessing bees walking to the flowers. I'm not sure if that should be allowed, but they, they'll even walk out of the hive, do some foraging and walk back again. Um, but generally bees need a lot more forage than what you see here uh, in terms of the, the honeybee because they need um, you know, many hectares of uh, forage to produce a, a real amount of honey. But the native bee species often have a very short range and they might only even forage in a couple of hundred metres. So creating forage for them is a really good idea and you can picture it like a stepping stone across the urban landscape. If you plant forage, what you're doing is creating one more uh, piece of habitat, especially if you've got some wild spaces in your garden as well, for those species to then have a stepping stone to get to the next place somebody's planted a great little garden. And what you'll find is then corridors will be set up between our wild spaces, between our parks, between our mountains that still have our forest on it. And that is a big deal for, for pollinators, a big deal for, for them to be able to, to once more get from A to B, to be able to procreate and, and um, instead of being locked into a tiny little area, it really does increase the chances of survival, especially uh, if those places are safe and free from insecticide. And of course, it's not just the distance, but what's um, different by uh, about many of the native species that we have here in Australia is that they're solitary. Um, and so they don't, unlike a honeybee, which is a, um, a, a social insect, insect and lives in a hive and it stores its food in the hive, it puts honey stores and pollen stores and it stores them to, so that it can... Um, sit, look after the, the colony over a long period of time. Many of our native species are solitary and they don't go out and collect and store food. So they need to be able to have access to food on an ongoing basis. Um, and so they, we don't, they don't want to be travelling too far and using energy. They just want to go out and have their little, little buffet. That's right. So some of these species you'll see use the, the bamboo tubes in the little pollinator hotels that a lot of people make. We often do a, a run using offcuts from the flow hives around Christmas time to actually create uh, little pollinator houses you can put in your garden. Or the best place I've found for them is actually under some good shelter on the on the edge of your house. The pollinators flock to it and you get a very uh, a busy little pollinator house um, which is a, a fantastic way to support as well. Obviously, it's not all species. Other species, you need um, straw and leaves. Other species need holes in mud. Um, one easy thing you can do if you want to run out today um, and uh, create some habitat is get a drill and and find sizes, anything from um, probably your, your, your little finger 
um, smaller and drill holes as deep as the drill bit goes into some blocks of wood and put them out with a little bit of shelter that will also create homes for native bee species so, and other pollinators as well which is a fantastic thing and it really does help in a world where we've taken the majority of habitat away. It's really important that we put it back. Is there any more questions? We've got time for a couple more. Yeah, this is a good question that's just come in. Just in terms of councils as well, um, Ken's come in and saying, you know, he's often drawn council with all their big spraying and their signs spraying, spraying. Would there be any route way for the bee-friendly farming to also sort of get councils in different um, areas involved in that as well? Uh, that's probably a longer term, longer term issue. It's it is certainly an issue, and um, one that I'm aware of through some of the pollinator corridor proposals. That from council to council, there is so much variation. So I think that's a, that's a that's a whole other project on its own. <laughs> It's fantastic work in other countries. I think it was Ireland. It's been viewed very favourably, having all of these beautiful pollinators uh, corridors beside the road, which is um, an amazing, uh, an amazing thing. And it really is um, supportive to also have our roadsides. So a whole other project. Obviously, we need lots of people working on lots of different angles. One of the great things is becoming a beekeeper. What we find when people become beekeepers, they all of a sudden start noticing the, the, the flowers on the trees and and what bees need and, and um, helping to campaign for people to put away the insecticides and get out the habitat. And just that understanding that the world is made up of a matrix of life that all has to be interconnected and supporting each other. And that's what beef friendly farming is about. It's about turning the ship around from, from broad scale monocultures that are really largely a desert for bees uh, most of the year to places that have homes for, for our species of not only the European honeybee, but also all of the other native bee species. So for those that are just tuning in, Fiona is CEO of the Wean Bee Foundation. She's, she's helped bring bee-friendly farming to Australia and also worked on many other great projects to support pollinators and habitat. We've helped kick off the program by donating some of the funds from, from uh, our our project, um, thebeekeeper.org, which is a great online education platform, raising funds to help do wonderful things like supporting um, bee-friendly farming. So thank you very much for all of you that are part of our beekeeper.org. If you want more information about bee-friendly farming, follow the links below and, and uh, also share it far and wide. If you know somebody who would like to become a bee-friendly farmer or you'd like them to become a bee-friendly farmer, make sure you share them the information and see how we go. Um, thank you very much. Um, have we got a, a, a last question? Yeah, um, actually, Lisa was just asking, just wondering about the Canadian version of the site. Are there planting guides available for Canada? Yeah, there are, um, actually. So if you go to the Pollinator Partnership uh, website, uh, so if you look up Bee Friendly Farming um, uh, in America, America and Canada, they have bioregional planting guides or eco-regional planting guides uh, for Canada and, and all across North America. Fantastic. Well, there's just one, I'm not sure, Megan's just saying that she went to the Bee Friendly farming.org.au site but it's saying it's currently unavailable is that just a glitch or is everything okay so fiona will fix that up as quick there's as probably so many people going there right now but it, it was i um wasn't aware that it was down but that's a bit embarrassing that's very embarrassing if it is so um, Fiona will fix that up as soon as possible. So um, you'll be able to follow the links in the comments below. Thank you for letting us know that um, that page is down. And uh, also encourage people to join up to the program. Fiona was letting us know that it's not only for big farmers, it's also for apiarists, it's also for people in their backyard if you want to join the program as well and become bee friendly. Thank you very much for tuning in today and thank you very much for Fiona, uh, for, th 
all your great work, Fiona, and keep it up and hope to um, to hear some updates soon about how many people are signing up for the program and the effect it's having here in Australia. Thank Pleasure. you. Pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much. And th we just so appreciate the, the support that we get from Flow. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks again.